Everyone's... Hello, hi. Yes. How are you? Hello, Fabiane. How is everyone? Yeah, we're good. Uh, I guess everybody's super excited to have you here because we mm -hmm. have a lot of people. You see, we have like almost 6,500 people joining wow, that nation today. So yeah, lot. you have a big audience. And Fabiane, well, uh, now be, be aware that right now we have two Brazilians on the stage. So it's a, it's a very nice opportunity because Fabiane, she's a Brazilian friend from, from me. Well, I'm Brazilian too. And she's also, uh, besides being a Java champion, she's one of the world's top experts in data science and data engineering. I'm pretty sure she has a lot to share with us. Uh, her company, I think it's uh, one of the largest, not the largest in, uh, the, in, the, in its uh, line of business in Latin America. So uh, I don't want to uh, like spend more time because Fabienne, we're eager to hear from you. Great. It's always, always good to see Edson. I miss him in, in, in Brazil now that he's moved to the US. But let me share my screen here so you can see my, my slides. And I can see there is another Brazilian in the chat. So. Um, I'm going to put in presentation mode and I will not be able to see the chat actually. So Edson, if you see something that I have to say or to answer or something, just just say something, okay? Hey, no worries. Okay, so thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, I'm here uh, in Brazil, as Edson said. My name is Fabiane. Uh, I'm a long, long, long time Java developer. Uh, I've been working in data science for eight years, more or less, right now. So I started working with data science when this field was actually starting. So I guess over these years, I, I saw everything. Uh, in the beginning, we would do uh, everything from um, installing a, a cluster to uh, create the machine learning algorithms. Right now, the, the field is a little more it's more specialized, uh, but uh, we learned a lot over the years. And uh, I guess the, the idea of this session is to share with you uh, a little bit of what it's data engineering and how Java developers can uh, help this, this field uh, to take uh, data science to the next level, right? Uh, so, for, for those uh, in the conference that are not familiar with data science, uh, usually a data science project follows more or less a pipeline like this one. It's called a data science pipeline. So usually you have several sources of data. It can be your transactional uh, information system. It can be log files from uh, maybe a, a, another system you have or can uh, even be uh, third-party data that it's, uh, that you need to 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 create your uh, machine learning models. Uh, usually, you have several sources of data. Uh, this is what you call raw data because it's data not 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 transformed data that you have to put inside your pipeline to me to be able to process this data. Uh, one very important part after you you actually gather your data and you. you may understand that getting these sources of data is, is not easy, usually involves several scripts or API calls or things like that. Uh, but once you have your data somewhere, uh, you have to do lots of cleaning and transformation, right? Uh, cleaning because usually there are lots of uh, bad data transformation because data is usually in a form that's not the one you want. And after you have your, your data cleaned and transformed, what you have to do is uh, what in data science we call feature engineering. Feature engineering is another set of transformation uh, of data, but is usually uh, well-defined, well-known uh, algorithms to transform the data and make the data more suitable for, for the machine learning algorithms. So for example, and. Uh, a typical example of feature engineering is getting uh, text values and transforming numbers. <coughs> uh, 
after you do this, usually you have to do some kind of data augmentation to get further data to run your model. And then you can actually do some artificial intelligence and create your, your models. Uh, the model part is where you are going to train, give data to an algorithm and train the models, and then uh, get some insights. And in the end, usually you have some kind of visualization to be able to, to see what you actually uh, discover from applying artificial intelligence machine learning over your data. Right. So uh, the fun part is doing the models <clears throat> and the insights. This is the machine learning part, the artificial intelligence part, or it can be made with just statistics. Uh, so uh, although uh, if you, when you think about a data science project, usually you think that you're going to do only this part. But actually, the other part, we, which is data engineering part, is uh, the most, uh, the, the, the biggest work you have to do. In fact, we believe that 90% uh, of the work in a data science project is spent in data engineering tasks. So uh, it's a lot. Huh? When you think about the machine learning and uh, data science, usually you, you only think on the, the fun part, but 90% of the work is done on the, on, the, on the rest, on getting the data and transforming and everything else. So in the last years, uh, the machine learning, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, evolved a lot. We have lots of algorithms. We have um, a cloud platforms that provide all the algorithms you need. You don't have to, to develop almost no new algorithms anymore. However, <clears throat> In data engineer, we did evolve uh, as fast as in machine learning. Uh, if uh, a while ago I went to GitHub and did a search for machine learning uh, projects, and you can see that you have uh, almost two hundred thousand projects uh, about machine learning. But if you look for data engineer, feature engineer or data lake that are uh, terms more common to, to data engineering, uh, you have a lot less projects. So if 90% of the time is spent in, in data engineering, why are we are not spending as much time in doing data engineering tools, right? So what happened is that uh, right now we are, we are in this, this moment in data science where uh, we need better data and we need to, to improve uh, data engineering in order to uh, be able to uh, fulfill the promise of data science. So I know several companies that, uh, for example, hired 100 uh, data scientists and then found out that they just didn't have enough tools and data for them to, to be able to do, to do the, the job. So uh, someone told me, uh, a few months later uh, that I hired a hundred data scientists, but maybe I have work for 10 of them. So uh, what we need right now is to improve data engineering to be able to do more with data science. And as Java developers, uh, we have a, a, a great opportunity here because uh, what is missing for doing uh, a better data engineer is basically, basically uh, creating better tools and better architectures. And uh, if there's something that we know how to do is better architectures and better tools, right? So if you see a pipeline like this, as Java developers, I'm sure you can think of several ways of implementing one of these, and it's not hard, right? You are going to do a script to retrieve the data, then maybe you are going to do uh, a software that is going to loop over the data and uh, uh, apply several validations and then transformations. And then you can uh, maybe get data from a third part to do data augmentation and merge with the data you have. So it's not, it's not hard to do a pipeline like this. The problem is how to do a pipeline like this at scale, right? 
because usually you are not going to do just one, you're going to do several of these pipelines. So just to give you an example, in my company, we process 3.5 billion new records per day, and we run uh, 4,000, more than 4,000 pipelines per day. So imagine if, you, if you're going to do this uh, by hand, uh, it's not going to scale, right? So usually uh, when you are training to be a data scientist and you do online training, for example, there are several good courses out there. Usually uh, this training happens uh, in what I call uh, the data, data science fictional world. So usually in, in the, the fictional world when you are learning, uh, there's, it seems that there's no big data and there's no legacy code. Uh, it seems that when if you finish your experiments and you have a model, the job's done. And it seems that there's always a data lake with all the data you need. Of course, this is not true. And in the real world, things are a little bit different. First, you have lots of data. It's not just uh, data that it's going to fit in your machine. Usually you're going to have lots of data that you need a cluster to process. Uh, or even data that is sensitive and you can't just uh, run the data in your machine. You have to have some kind of infrastructure to run in the cloud. Uh, and you have legacy, uh, lots of legacy code, probably Java code, right? And why this is important? It's because in, in your company, you probably have lots of library that you built over time that can help uh, with several activities, including cleaning data. So, for example, if you have a, a company identifier that you have some, some kind of uh, validation that, it, that you already programmed, it makes sense to be able to use the same code you already created uh, in your data science projects, right? And not think of a data science projects, project as a, 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 a totally independent project that's not going to use your legacy code. Uh, and we need, in the real world, we need tools to be able to experiment, to test. For experimentation and testing, we have tools that are very well known in data science, but we have very little, very uh, little tools for deploying and to catalog the machine learning models. And this is very important uh, as, you, as you start investing uh, more and more in machine learning in your company. We need to have tools to catalog and build a data lake. So uh, many companies create a data lake just by creating a, a bucket in some cloud storage. Uh, but it's not just that. You need to have some sort of catalog to know where the data came from, what license you have uh, for, for using that data, uh, when it was updated, and so on. Right. So a data lake is a lot more than just a bucket somewhere with the data you need. And you need, you need security so people are able, only people that can see the data uh, uh, are going to see the data and so on. And in the real world, we need good architecture practice to build scalable solutions to process data and train models. Uh, it's, not, it's not something with this amount of data that you have, it's not something that you can uh, just uh, train in your machine or in a machine that you create uh, in the cloud and then you turn the machine off. Usually you have you need to have some some kind of cluster that uh, is able to, to deal with large volumes of data, right? So for Java, we have a tool that probably most of you uh, know already that's called Apache Spark. Uh, Spark, uh, there are other uh, similar tools in Java, but Spark, it's uh, probably the most used tools for processing large volumes of data. Spark is a framework that uh, it's, it's very fast and allows to process uh, data, uh, allows to do distributed processing. So, so usually you have an Apache Spark cluster and Spark is going to deal off with all the complexity of dividing the data and processing and, and so on. And uh, inside the, the Spark ecosystem, you have two tools that can help Java developers a lot. One is, is called Spark SQL, and another one 
is called uh, Apache MLlib. MLlib is a, a machine learning library that have several uh, algorithms. Probably, uh, the, if you probably most of the algorithms you're going to need are implemented in the ML, MLLlib, and it's a, a Java library. So we talked a lot about uh, data lakes when doing data science, but there's something we need to talk about. It's, and that's uh, a code lake. So having the code uh, available to be used in your distributed processing, so you can create those data science pipelines uh, in, a, in a more scalable and uh, fast way. So with Spark SQL, uh, we as Java developers have a, a good opportunity to do that. So this is an example of uh, a Spark SQL code. This is a uh, Scala code, but you can write more or less the same thing with, with Java as well. So uh, here in the same line, I'm just reading a file, right? It's very intuitive. Uh, and then I can uh, get these, these records. This is what Spark SQL calls a data frame. And I can filter the data frame uh, by some some condition and then i can write back uh, the data to a new file right so this is just for you to understand how spark sql uh, works you can see that the code is very uh, is very simple to understand and it's very easy to do uh, file uh, handling and uh, and things like that so as Spark SQL runs over Spark, what happens is that when you, you execute this code, you are actually uh, executing distributed code. So this is going to run over a cluster that can have two machines or maybe 100 machines, 400 machines. It doesn't matter. You can scale uh, the cluster as your data increases as well. But better than using Spark SQL is using Spark SQL with your code, right? So this is how you create your code lake. So what I'm doing here is just I'm uh, create a new instance of this class Spark GeoHash. This is a class a class that I created, and uh, I can register this uh, function. This is going to be a user defined function in Spark SQL. I can register this function, and then I can use the function inside Spark SQL. So my legacy code can be encapsulated in things in a, in a function like this. And I can actually call my legacy code uh, from Spark SQL. And this code is going to run in a cluster in a uh, distributed processing uh, with scalability and so on. So it's a great way of using your legacy Java code to help you create your data science pipelines. And following this strategy, there are other uh, nice things that you can do. Uh, usually, you can create uh, a plugin architecture using Spark SQL and create things like semantic data types, transformations, aggregations, and other functions for that. Uh, semantic data types are very interesting for data science. Uh, because it opens a lot of possibilities uh, that are not uh, are not so obvious. So in Spark SQL, you have several data types, but they are uh, common data types like like string, uh, double, uh, long, and things like like that. Uh, you can, when you read a, a, a data a data data store like this file here, you can say to Spark that you are going to use this schema. And you say uh, the data you have and what type they have. So I'm saying here, for example, that this field is, is a string. The first field is a string. Uh, but let to this is a double, right? So when I read a file passing a schema, what Spark is going to do, Spark SQL is going to do, is that if your data is not compatible with the types informed in the schema, the data is going to be ignored. So this allows you to do the first, a first phase of cleaning the data. So if you say that your field is going to have doubles and uh, this field has a string, the data is, is going to be ignored and you have 
your, your data automatically claimed, right? But you can, uh, with Spark SQL, also create your own data types. So for example, in this example here, I created a data type uh, called uh, uh, social security number data type, right? So uh, if I have a social security data number uh, type here and I implement validation here, I can validate automatically when a, a, a data type that is not a valid social security number comes in. So it's another level of cleaning that I can do. So here is an example. I'm just, it's the same example as before, but instead of saying that the field SSN is a string, I'm saying that some other type, it's a, a, the type that I created, which means that when Spark SQL uh, reads this file here, uh, if the, the one of the data is not a valid social security number, the data is going to be ignored. So it's another level of data cleaning you can do using legacy code and using Java and using Spark SQL. So once you have semantic data types, there are lots of things that you can do that can be a game changer in data science. First, once you have these types defined, you can have type detectors. Because one of the, the biggest problems in data engineering is to, uh, once you have uh, data, is to understand what, what that data really is. So if you can have type detectors, you can detect when a column is a string with a, or is a double or a phone or a email, and this can uh, bring more intelligence to your system. Also, it helps a lot, helps a lot with privacy and uh, GDPR, for example. So if you have a, a field with a semantic that says that this field is a email, for example, you know that email is a sensitive information. So you can, for example, automatically anonymize that information, right? And you have automatic validation. And in the future, you can have some sort of automatic feature engineer, which is a more advanced topic, but it can be, be done as well if you have data types with semantics. Uh, just to show you how to create functions, uh, you can have several functions uh, and transformations, transformations and aggregations created with Spark SQL. So here's an example on how to create one of these functions. Here you can see that I'm calling a Java class uh, called uh, GeoHash, that's my legacy code, and I'm just uh, encapsulating this in a Spark SQL function. Once I do this, I can, like I showed before, call this function uh, as part of my, my data science pipelines and automatically clean the data and transform data, right? So it's a very important way of uh, reusing your Java legacy code. Right, so once you have uh, all the, the infrastructure and the architecture in place to be able to process the data using Spark and maybe using your, your legacy code, uh, you can give to your uh, data scientists uh, a platform where they can do experimentations, right? But there's actually a gap between experimentation and going to production. The difference is that when data science are experimenting, usually they are using samples. So they don't, they are not going to do experimentation with big data. Usually they want a sample of your data to be able to do the ex experimentation. And usually the samples are not uh, available, uh, readily available. Usually they have to compute that as, as well. Usually they use a tool that's called uh, data science notebooks. The, the most known tool uh, is called Jupyter. Uh, and Jupyter and the other tools like that are tools that allow you to write code and execute code uh, while, while you write in it. So you can do a very fast and interactive uh, uh, experimentation. When you go to production, things are a lot different. First, you are going to use big data and not just samples. Uh, you have to have, you need to have some form of a scheduling system so you can schedule your pipelines to to, exec, to be executed in batch, right? Because uh, you are not going to do a, a data science pipeline that's going to run just once. Usually you have to run multiple times uh, at least 
uh, every time you have new data. And you, you need to have some sort of logging system so you can understand what happened uh, with the pipeline. So uh, one architecture that uh, has been used by, by some companies and we use in our company as well, and I know that Netflix has an approach uh, pretty much like this as well, is to uh, create this, uh, no, so the notebooks, right? that are created, usually they uh, use a tool like this. This is called uh, Spark Notebooks, but it's very similar to Jupyter, that is more well-known uh, notebook tool. And usually you write code, and if you can, uh, if you can connect the notebook to, to your code lake and to your data lake, right, you can provide to the data scientists uh, a tool that is very, um, it's very interesting for doing experimentation. But this code, uh, usually when uh, uh, companies use uh, notebooks, usually they have to reprogram the experimentation you did here in a software that's going to run in batch, right? So one approach that uh, several companies are using right now is to get the same code that you created during your experimentation phase and run the same code in production. In order to do that, you have you need to have these uh, notebooks with some form of uh, parameters and a scheduler. If you have this, you can have an architecture more or less like this one. So you need a scheduler. Uh, in Java, you can use uh, Quartz or any other uh, library that allow you to schedule jobs. And then when there's a pipeline to be executed, this pipeline goes to a, a queue. Then you have to, some, to have some form of lock to, to acquire the data from the data lake. Then you call a pipeline executor. That's another piece of software that you write. And this software is going to send parameters to the notebook you wrote. And this notebook is going to be executed over the Spark cluster. The interesting part that is that the execution of the pipeline or the notebook can be used as the log itself. Because uh, notebooks, when you executed uh, each of the cells in the pipeline, uh, these uh, notebooks tools, usually they save also the output of the execution. So you can use your own, uh, 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 the execution of an, the notebook as your logging system. So it's a very, uh, very clever way of uh, executing uh, pipelines, Spark pipelines in batch. If you are interested in this architecture, uh, I can uh, send you uh, articles about how to do it. And it's very efficient and very elegant. So just one more thing we need to do is we need to talk about um, model deployment. Right, so so far we talked about um, how to clean the data, transform, and uh, make pipelines that are going to run in a cluster. But what about model deployment? So models are the result of training uh, uh, a piece of machine learning, right? So usually when you are creating a model in machine learning, you give data to a machine learning machine learning algorithm, and this algorithm is going to produce a model. A model is a piece of code that has uh, uh, the result of the training inside, right? So what happens is that uh, as more and more uh, decisions about our lives are made by artificial intelligence, uh, we need to have some way of uh, tracking these models, right? We need to know which data was used to produce it, uh, what algorithm was used, um, uh, when was uh, a version uh, created? Uh, you need to have the, the past versions because if, if you made a decision based on a past version of a, a model, it's very important to know how this model was done, right? And this is going to become even more important uh, in the, the following years as uh, more and more regulations are coming into place that uh, uh, don't want to have these models just as uh, black boxes, right? So in order for us to do model deployment, we need to talk about not about data engineering, but um, about 
machine learning engineering. So machine learning engineers is, is another field that's not uh, very well developed yet, uh, but I'm, I'm sure that Java developers can help a lot in this field. So for, for doing uh, machine learning engineering, you need to have a model catalog. Uh, you need to know how the model was created, what parameters were used, what data was used, uh, what license you had to that data you use it. You need to have some sort of model versioning and uh, some way of model execution. So uh, we as Java developers are very uh, used to deal with different versions, but uh, you can, we probably can believe that in, in the model world, uh, this is still not very well uh, solved. They're, they're not uh, a standard uh, tool for that or anything like that. So in Apache MLlib, there's a, a, a concept called uh, pipelines, MLlib pipelines, that uh, can help a lot in, in programming pipelines with machine learning in Java. So here is an example. This first part here uh, is uh, the feature engineering part. Then you have, uh, you create a machine learning algorithm. This is a logistic regression, it's a very well-known machine learning algorithm. And then you put everything in a pipeline, which is pretty much like, like a, a list of things that have to be executed. And then you can train the model and save the model to a file. Later, you can read this model and apply this model uh, as part of your, uh, Spark SQL pipeline. So this way you have the, the whole uh, life cycle of a data science project created in Java and uh, with scalability, right? Um, so it's a very, uh, Spark, it's a very powerful tool and uh, we really need more uh, architecture um, uh, and more machine learning engineering in this field. And I'm sure that uh, this, the experience we have as Java developers can help a lot. Okay, so I think I used all my time. So uh, if you want more information or you want to discuss, uh, this is my Twitter here. And if you have time for a few questions, add some, I'm all yours. All right, Fabiane, thank you for this amazing session. I'm pretty sure like uh, everybody learned a lot of about data science because I'm not from this area. So yeah, it was super interesting to learn more about this. Unfortunately, we don't have time for uh, questions. We got a bit of delay in, in, when we start in the track and nobody posts questions here in the chat too, but we have a lot of Brazilian flags. You see, you have a Brazilian audience. That's good, that's here good. In the day. So, Fabiane, I would like to thank you very much uh, again. It's always awesome to have you here. It's so unfortunate that we won't be able to see each other in person, but we can make it up next year, maybe. Maybe next year. So thanks a lot. And if, if you want to continue the discussion, uh, just uh, you can find me on Twitter. And thanks a lot. Bye, thank everyone. You. Bye.